Hey everybody, we're all at thelogbook.com here with yet another take on phosphor dot fossils. It's been a while since you've heard that, haven't you? The that part of the website has been around for about 20 years, and it's been about 10 years since the two DVDs came out that were a lot of fun to put together. A lot of people thought they were fun to watch, and I know they were certainly bread and butter for me for quite a while. But, you know, things are a bit tighter on time now, and so I thought I'd do something a little bit more immediate that combines the game history aspect as well as the the video part of it. It's always been in the Phosphor Dot Fossils DNA. And so even though I probably don't have the sheer amount of caffeine coursing through my veins that is probably required to do video game play-alongs on YouTube, we are going to play the 1985 computer game Project Space Station, which was released by HESWare for the Commodore 64, the Apple II, and eventually for the DOS-based PC system. It's not a violent game. No one has to die, although someone might if you are not a very good space program manager. And uh, it's still just a lot of fun. It's one of my favorite games from that era. I spent a lot of time with it, very fond memories of it. And so I thought, you know, sort of in line with the logbook's mission of combining pop culture with actual science and space exploration history, I would not only play the game, but explain some of the places where it diverges widely from reality. So it's going to be kind of a low-key play-along. I'm doing this late at night, and everyone else in the house is asleep. And this is really the only time I have to do something like this. So suit up like my little friend here, sit back, strap yourself into the cockpit. We're going to build a space station. Project Space Station. I'm going to play this without a joystick. And yes, I remember this distinctly. There's a uh, a disc swapper. It was a double-sided floppy. So, start a new mission. One of the first things I like to do here is change the keyboard layout. You okay over there? One of my cats is having uh, having fun. All right, so we are ready. Start a new mission. We're gonna name this the Maria Cat Mission because it kind of is. All right, when you start the game, it is not in real time. Everything is sort of in limbo, and uh, you've got a little bit of time to play with things. One of the first things you have to do is set up a budget for your space program, and this is incredibly important, especially at the beginning of the game, to get the balance right. The most expensive thing right off the bat is going to be your space station modules. Go ahead and anticipate spending some major cash there. Operations you never want to underfund because later in the game when things are tight the last thing you want to see is some crazy error message like you can't launch a shuttle right now because you can't afford to launch a shuttle. So, launch scheduling, we're not really 
We're not really there yet, but there is one thing I want to do, and that is turn auto packing off before we buy any equipment. The auto packing in Project Space Station is kind of maddening because it really uh, it doesn't help you out much. It's very random and you wind up having to go through and undo a lot of it. When you're hiring crew at the beginning of the game, really the only thing you need are flight engineers and shuttle pilots and possibly even just shuttle pilots. When you go into a crew member's profile, you get to see uh, a lot of information about them, about their personality. Now this really comes into play later when you are hiring and staffing for research projects on the station, because basically you're locking a bunch of people into a tin can and telling them, okay, now work together and accomplish great things, please. And uh, there are some clues in these crew profiles as to how well that's going to work. So, yeah, you don't need to hire you know, your physicists, your science staff just yet because you don't have R&D projects going. want to go ahead and stock up on you know, the real essentials. The orbital construction pod is kind of the heart and soul of the game. It's where you spend a lot of your time, especially in the Apple II version, which forces you to uh, do a lot of house cleaning tasks dealing with uh, space junk in orbit, which is a delightful part of the game that I'll introduce you to shortly. The research packs are essential for the R&D projects you will be running, so you might as well buy them now. Uh, one thing you cannot possibly buy enough of, although apparently I just did, is you can't have enough satellites on hand. Satellites are bread and butter, and they are basically how you get consistent funding for everything. So, payload assistance modules are things that you attach to the bottom of a satellite if it needs to go further than low Earth orbit. If it needs to be a geosynchronous satellite, you attach a PAM to it. So everything looks good there for starters. Module selection. It's kind of like a pizza. You want one with everything. However, in some cases, I'm going to have to go back and get more money. <laughs> in some cases, you will want more than one of everything. Um, especially once you get to running research projects on the space station. Those are very power-hungry tasks, and uh, you, can, you can always have too little power, but you can never have too much. So for starters, we're going to get a power module. Every power module has to have a radiator module. The laboratory module, this is where your R&D tasks will be taking place. You may eventually have to expand to two of them. Uh, note that that is not a cheap item. Crew module, well, this is where everyone is going to live. For every two crew modules, you have to have one emergency module, because one event that the game throws at you are solar flare events and other space weather events, and your crew has to be able to survive those. Station design is kind of a time sink. It lets you set up, you know, how you want your station to look without any constraints of how much the modules will cost or so on. You don't have to have a station design on the books in order to start your space program. And so I would only mess with station design 
in this early stage of the game before you have approval of your space program's budget. Um, you know, before it's costing you anything, basically. I'll take at least two pods up on your very first flight. At least one satellite, at least one PAM. And, uh... <laughs> Simpson and Millhouse, really? Welcome to 1985. They had no idea. Okay, so we're going to do this kind of like they were doing in 1981, where the early flights were very much a case of just sending up two guys. Now, there's a uh, very deliberate way of setting up your station, setting up your launch manifest, especially in this early stage before it's really costing you much. You want to go ahead and get satellites up there, but you want every flight to bring you at least one piece of the station. Oh, I didn't assign crew. Well, that that's a ship that's not going anywhere. <laughs> you have to have a shuttle pilot to fly the shuttle. Okay, so Millhouse and Walsh. Set Simpson and Steel on the third flight. Never let yourself run out of satellites up there. Okay, so the fourth flight. More satellites, more PAM. Tastes better than spam. And let me see. second Pam up there. We'll go ahead and assign him. One of the shuttle pilots from the early flights will have to have flown his flight and be released back to the crew roster for you to assign him. So at this point you're just setting up very basics without a crew. The sooner you can get a hangar module, a crew module, an emergency module, and one power and radiator module up, the sooner you can actually slow the pace of your shuttle launches because at that point you can have someone staying on the station to do the satellite launch tasks, which we'll uh, get into shortly. And uh, let me see, can I put any more on this? Shuttle payload is full. All right, so we're looking at, that was our seventh, our seventh flight, we just, no, our sixth flight. Okay, in six flights, we're going to have all of our station modules up there that we have now. In the seventh flight, you want to go ahead and take your research packs, bio research packs, material research packs, and general research packs. Man, those things take up a lot of space, don't they? That way you can get research projects started, and that will probably be a stage in the game where you are also taking up, you know, six, seven people per shuttle. Alright, so, 
We haven't started bleeding money yet. <laughs> Summary and approval. Hey, let's start the mission, begin the launches. Now, Project Space Station came out in late 1985, and so one of the elements of it that doesn't date particularly well is that the two shuttles at your disposal, your two shuttle fleet, consists of Atlantis and Challenger. Now, this is the case with both the Commodore 64 and Apple II versions, which came out in 85. It was 1987 before Project Space Station was ported to the IBM PC, and obviously this is post-Challenger disaster, and they decided that uh, it would be much safer, obviously, you know, you couldn't still be flying Challenger in some alternate universe, so they future-proofed it by replacing Challenger with Columbia. The hold events in your countdown are pretty random. They happen a lot more often than is strictly speaking necessary. However, you need to uh, pay close attention to your weather. Now, it's pretty clear right now, but you noticed I just did that. I just put us on hold. If your weather gets to where it's, you know, there are thunderstorms in the vicinity or what have you, then uh, the launch window missed because I was talking about it. Oops. The flashing bar at the bottom, you press M anytime you see that flashing. Deploy satellite to low orbit. Okay. Well, this is going swimmingly already. <laughs> okay, my entire launch schedule has been pushed back. So, um, solar flare predicted to occur. Okay, that's one of the events that requires the emergency module aboard the station. Okay, we'll try to launch Challenger on day before my 13th birthday. How exciting. <sighs> the If the weather conditions get bad in the game and you do not manually hold to kind of wait them out, that can scrub your launch. Okay, it is now been sitting on the pad for a day hoping it doesn't scrub. All systems are go. Are they really? No, they're not. <laughs> the complete failure of the onboard computer guidance system, but two seconds later we're going to go anyway. Okay, here comes one of the uh, really the few concessions to arcade style action in the game. Launch and landing have a very similar setup and the the object of this part of the game is to keep your indicator centered in the squares as best as possible. Now you can slip and slide around a little bit then it starts getting a little bit crazy on you and you've got to stay on top of it. Now, what the squares really mean during the launch phase is if you do a good job of, you know, threading that needle, then you uh, arrive pretty close to the docking module, which is at a fixed point in Earth orbit. Now we were to deploy a satellite to low orbit. Let's go ahead and do that. We're in our construction pod. Fire satellite to orbit. Get gone. All right, satellite has been deployed. And now the money starts flowing in. The construction pod, as you can see, um, 
owes more than just a little bit to 2001 is Space Odyssey. Space debris has entered space station orbit. Space debris is going to be the bane of your existence. Trust me on this. All right, I've grasped Pam, and I have no idea if she likes that or not. Sorry. So we have a Pam without a satellite. The next flight up will bring another satellite. Now let's go check out the space debris situation. Earth orbit for the purposes of the Apple II version is something like 8 to 10 screens wide. 4, 5, aha, whoa! Gotta work some Newtonian physics here. It's kind of a neat element of the game, but also frustrating. Satellite deployment income added to the budget. Cha-ching! And this is why you don't let yourself run out of satellites. The Apple II version in particular is very sensitive to um, collisions when you're in the construction pod. To get rid of space debris, you put it at the bottom of the screen and you leave it. The drag of the atmosphere will pull it down. It won't be there here in a few minutes. More space debris. Um, the Apple version of this space debris is an endless task and it's really something to worry about once you have a stat station and can bring a pod out from the station and deal with it then. For right now though we are going to bring the Challenger back down to land the operation cost. The, you remember when we were setting up the budget there was a line item for operations and I tried to give that a pretty healthy budget. One thing that really drains your operations budget is keeping a shuttle in orbit for a long time. In this game a shuttle can stay in orbit for roughly 30 days. Now it's a little bit of science fiction there because at most your shuttles were capable of staying in orbit for about let me see seven to ten days obviously when you're landing you want to kill your speed so you keep your nose up at the beginning then you level out and come in for a landing at the runway here we go the Apple II version of Project Space Station is the easiest for you know in terms of landing the shuttle. The DOS and C64 versions are just brutal. Now Project Space Station assumes each shuttle's life support system will last about 30 days like I said. The longest shuttle flight was in November 1996 and that lasted only 17 and a half days. Anything longer than the seven or ten days that the average shuttle was equipped for required a package installed in the cargo bay called EDO, or Extended Duration Orbiter. And the only orbiters, the only shuttles that were actually equipped to accept the EDO package were um, Endeavour at first, and then Columbia. Now, they eventually took the EDO connection hardware out of Endeavor because they wanted Endeavor to be able to carry more cargo to the space station. And the space station had a reciprocal power and consumables feed once the shuttle was docked to it. So you didn't really need the EDO. You could keep the shuttle up at the station for you know, presumably as long as you liked, unless it was starting to actually drain the station's resources significantly. All right, now we're moving up since our launch schedule got kicked back a bit. Our next launch, hey, it's in a couple of days. Your, your early days, you want the launches to kind of be fast and furious. It doesn't actually cost you anything <laughs> operationally to do that. Technically, you can have two shuttles in the sky at the same time 
although that gets really expensive. Like I said, you know, the moment you have, you know, the moment you light the rockets underneath it, your operation costs go upward significantly. And so keeping two of them in the sky, tracking two of them in orbit, having to land two of them, that's needlessly expensive. Now there are some rescue scenarios that may require it, but only if you're really clumsy. The pods, the construction pods, are susceptible to damage from impact, bouncing off of station modules, bouncing off of space, space debris, uh, you know, bouncing off the station itself, or even bouncing off of satellites. The pod has a finite amount of damage it can take, and when we um, when we bring out the pod for EVA after we get Atlantis in orbit here in a few seconds, you'll see the three gauges at the bottom indicate damage, fuel, and oxygen. If a pod becomes so damaged that it is disabled, then you have to send another pod out for it, basically. Okay, since I got the Atlantis up just about right on the money. So we're right under where we were before with Columbia. Now I'm going to kind of set up a shipyard of satellites that I can waltz out to and just launch one once I have someone on the station devoted to that task. You always want to have one person, probably someone like a flight engineer, who is not attached to any R&D projects on the station. That way you don't have to peel someone away from a research project if you have to go launch a satellite or clean up space debris or what have you. Speaking of space debris, speak the space devil's name and he will appear. It's... I'm probably making too much fuss about it. It's it's just an annoying thing in the Apple II version. The PC version, you barely get any space debris and getting rid of it is very easy. Uh, the Apple II and Commodore versions, there's a lot of space debris. Okay, I keep bumping into the payload module there. You can see there I'm picking up some damage. If that green gauge gets all the way over to high, then you're in trouble. Now I'm already using up quite a bit of fuel and no small amount of oxygen there. So we need to uh, stop bouncing off these things like they're bumper cars. Get them in place. You can see there I kinda got myself caught in a little, little bounce there get these satellites up into the higher part of the screen where they will stay in orbit longer. You, if you recall, I put the space debris down at the very bottom of the screen and you know that allowed it to re-enter the atmosphere. Anything you leave at the bottom of the screen can eventually fall out of orbit. So you can't leave satellites there. Um, you can't leave a... if you have a pod get stranded at the bottom of the screen for any reason. That's really bad. You need to get another pod out there and get that guy back in the shuttle. And, uh, yeah, any station modules, you need to go ahead and put those on the station. Duh. <laughs> I hear you say, but it's, uh, deploy satellite to geosynchronous orbit. Generally, that's going to bring in a little more money than a low Earth orbit satellite. So let's get up here and light this thing up. To launch a geosynchronous satellite, you want to have the PAM dock to the satellite and fire the PAM instead of firing the satellite. Off she goes. Thanks, PAM. I mentioned the EDO package allowed for 
you know, something as long as 17 and a half days. There was at one point a plan to mount a second EDO pallet in the cargo bay that would have allowed for 28 day missions. But again, once you were birthed at the space station, you you don't need that because you are breathing off the space station's air and its consumables. I, they call that a reciprocal link, and you know it even included electrical energy from the station's uh, solar power arrays. So you know once you were hooked up to the station, you didn't need an EDO, and so the the double EDO project was abandoned fairly early on. Kind of a, a sad note that the EDO hardware that was being used did not make it to the end of the shuttle program because the mounting hardware for the cargo bay for the EDO package was lost when Columbia was lost in 2003. The Commodore and PC versions have you run out of runway really soon after your wheels touch ground. The Apple II version is much more forgiving. I'm playing the Apple II version primarily because I'm very accustomed to the game dynamics and that it's just more instinctive. Okay, shuttle repairs will take seven days. If you come in really hot and land really hard, you could be looking at a setback of something more on the order of 28 to 31 days or 14 days in some cases. Let's go ahead and give the uh, money that we've brought in from our two satellite launches to the toward buying more modules. We want to go ahead and pick up more power and radiator modules and let's go ahead and get those on the manifest. All right, since we have flown two shuttles, the crews of those shuttles have, you know, now rotated back into available status. So we can put them back, we can assign them another fly. You only have so many shuttle pilots, and they are a precious resource. I bring that up because there are scenarios in the game that can result in crew loss. Everything's coming up Millhouse. A pod can run out of oxygen with an operator stranded in it. This is why you always take two pods on your first flight, so you always have a backup pod to go rescue the first. Now, you can run into a problem that I call the construction pod conga line, which is that you get your second pod damaged trying to retrieve the first. Maybe it's in the middle of a field of space debris. And the this is why you buy three pods at the beginning of the game and you take an extra one up at a later date and permanently leave it at the space station. Although there's a there's a funny thing about the pods and it's kind of a it's kind of a bug in the game that once you have once you take a pod up on a flight that pod is available to all future flights. <laughs> there's no real rhyme or reason to it. It's like it's a variable that they forgot to track. Um, Although, really, I think it balances the game a lot better. I can't imagine having to pack the pod in every flight and taking up that much space that could go to other cargo. 
Now, if you don't move your launch schedule up at all, like I just did not, then you can sit here and wait a while. <laughs> so we were talking about crew loss scenarios. You can have a pod run out of oxygen. You can have an orbiter run out of oxygen. And everyone on that orbiter, if they are waiting for rescue somehow, and it doesn't come, you've just killed a crew. And, you know, if you lose a shuttle pilot among that, or there are some scientific disciplines that are re represented by only one person available to you to hire in the game, you lose that person, you've pretty much lost whatever chance you have of doing any R&D projects that count on that person's unique skills. I think there's one astronomer in the game. There's one agronomist in the game who can do things like uh, orbital crop inventory tasks in R&D. And deploy satellite to geosynchronous orbit. All right, Let's see if we can move this up a bit. Because if you don't get a satellite launched uh, very soon after very soon after the request for it is made. Uh, the game will notify you that satellite deployment has been turned over to the European Space Agency. Of course now, in the here and now, it would be SpaceX or Orbital ATK or some competitor along those lines. Okay, we'll uh, wait out the the endless random launch holds. Of course, mission control is holding countdown because of a small liquid hydrogen leak which occurred during the filling of the external tank. Two things that will not happen in this game, largely, I imagine, because it was written in 1985. You cannot lose a shuttle. You can't lose it during launch. You can't lose it during landing. Now you can, if you let, if you just don't give a crap about flying through the squares in the launch phase, it'll deposit you somewhere several screens away from the core space station module forcing you to spend that much more time and oxygen and fuel to move modules to the station. If you do not worry about, you know, staying centered in the squares during landing, you know, it'll get on your case about you lost a bunch of tiles, but it will never allow your shuttle to burn up and break up in the atmosphere. Bring out your pod. All right, so we want a geosynchronous launch. Oh, oh space debris. <coughs> All right, we're going to go over here to our little satellite yard, and we're going to get this thing. Yes, there is. Okay, it's this one. Can you fire the PAM on this one? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Space debris. Ooh, kind of close to my satellites. I will have to deal with that. All right. Get those suckers out of here. Get our money. I want my two dollars. <laughs> okay, so let's get this unsightly space debris. These wads of outer space toilet paper. Just unspecified space junk. And you know, I like how it's, uh, you know, just little 
asteroids, whatever. <laughs> Ooh, that pod has picked up some damage. But, yeah, you get into a loop where you're bouncing back and forth between two objects in a tight space. Um, it gets costly. Satellite deployment income. We are, as they say, in the money. Now I just want to take out the trash. Then I want to get the new station. Ah, one of them just uh, re-entered the atmosphere. Beep. Very uh, uneventful. Let me get these station modules Wah. off the uh, off the bottom of the screen because I don't want them to re-enter. That would be a very expensive mistake to make. <laughs> you can press R and rotate a module. Some modules fit together better than others. It's just uh, a thing you have to deal with. Okay. Let's get it up there, out of the way, get it off the bottom of the screen so it doesn't burn up. Don't let stuff burn up. That's, it's just, <laughs> it's a stupid thing to do. I think when I was playing this game when I was a kid, I let something tumble into the atmosphere just to see if it would do it like the space debris does it. It did. Oh, I can't dock that there. I'll tell you what. We will put it on top of this other one for now. Now I actually have a different layout in mind than this. But even the real, you know, the construction of the real International Space Station saw wildly different configurations over the years as bits were removed from one area of the station and placed elsewhere, you know, particularly the solar power arrays. So the, uh, you know, during landing you obviously want to follow the squares and minimize damage to your shuttle you know so you can have that one week turnaround now the one week turnaround is total science fiction um, I, I think that's just there to make the game playable you now in real life the fastest turnaround time between landing and the next launch for one shuttle was quite a bit slower than seven days it was 54 days um, 54 days between Atlantis landing on flight STS-51J and then launching for STS-61B. And 51J was a classified Department of Defense satellite deployment. They were only up there four days. And that was, that landing was on October 7th. And just after Thanksgiving, Atlantis was back in the sky for just under a week in orbit. And in between those two flights of Atlantis, uh, Challenger lifted off on what unfortunately would turn out to be her final completed mission. Now this was in late 85. In the 70s, one of the things that NASA relentlessly uh, flogged was this idea the shuttle flights would become so routine that there would be one leaving every week or so. And uh, it didn't happen <laughs> that way, obviously. 
And we're going to turn around and launch another one. You know, since we're talking about Go Fever, let's let's catch some Go Fever. We're going to launch this one just a couple of days after landing Challenger. We're going to take Atlantis up. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, this game is very 1985. Good weather. Big bucks. No whammies. Except for holding countdown. That's seven days. The actual typical turnaround for any single shuttle between missions on average was five to seven months. Not days. But, you know, this is a, this is a trade-off to make the game playable. I don't think anyone's going to stick around, you know, a couple of months between launches. That would be a very boring game, especially when you do not have the station set up to accommodate someone staying. Which I believe after this flight, we will have it set up where someone can at least stay up there and go launch satellites and clear the space debris. And at that point, we can reduce the frequency of launches a little bit. Whoop, 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 whoop. Losing my squares. Okay, I wasn't that far off. Okay. Now let's get our satellites situated so we can come out at our leisure and Just launch on demand. And that's kind of an interesting concept, though, because, again, it's a, a trade-off from reality to make the game work. But it sort of posits the notion that, you know, the satellites are <laughs> good for any task. Oh, this is a tight squeeze. him out of the way up here. The thing about going ahead and equipping every, you know, nearly every satellite with a PAM, you you won't need PAMs as often as you need satellites, but it um well I was trying to Oh, got tossed around a little bit there. Oops. Just call me Frank Poole. I'm gonna... Actually, we're going to bring this over here. Because what I want to do is kind of set up a, a second story on the station. And from that point is where all of the power structures will be attached. Not really for any aesthetic reason, but just to... It seems practical. You're... I mean, technically the game will let you, you know, put a power module and a radiator module in between two crew modules and, you know, call it a space station. The problem with that being that this assumes that your crew is somehow traveling through the solar power array, which that's not how solar power arrays work. At least not of the type that we currently have installed on the ISS. Dangerous docking area. Oh. Well... 
that sucks. Hmm. Spending a lot more time in orbit than I really intended to, but kind of have to get this done now. In fact, I'm going to go down here and get this off the off the ground floor so it doesn't burn up. It won't actually let you attach it, even though those two things do go together. Alright, so you have a crew module, an emergency module, a power module, and a radiator module. Once you get all these things connected, it is actually conceivable that I could have brought a third person and left them up here now. Probably should have, really. Because that way I could have someone up here to take care of the satellite business. The family satellite business. We haven't even gotten to the heart of the game yet, which is the R&D element of it. You know what, I think I am actually going to do what I just said and bring up three people on the next flight. Oh, 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 more money. Bring out your pods. I can't believe I didn't think to bring a third person on this flight. So we're going to go up here and launch this one since it's closest to us. And then we're going to get back in the station and uh, go home. If you fire a satellite to the wrong orbit, you will not get any money from it, and it will let you know that you fired it to the wrong orbit. Now, it doesn't have any effect on your on NASA's reputation, I suppose. Then again, you have to, again, place this in historical context, which is, at the time, NASA was the only game in town. You know, unless you did take it to European Space Agency, and have them put it on an Ariane. You know, of course, of course you were going to have NASA launch your satellite. Who else was there to do it? You know, especially during the Cold War, you did not have uh, Russia offering launch services on uh, Soyuz or Fregat rockets like they do now. You know, just participating in the international launch services marketplace. Um, this was not happening in 1985. Now, what was happening in 1985 was that the Soviets were about a year away from launching the core module of the Mir space station. And the interesting thing about that is Mir was first drawn, plans for Mir were first drawn up around 1976, if I'm not mistaken. It's, um, I'll leave a link to the event on the logbooks timeline, the history timeline, to, uh, to point that out. But the other thing, that the other project that was initiated in the mid-70s in the Soviet space program was their space shuttle, Buran. Buran was always intended to be joined in lockstep with Mir. Mir was always intended to be supplied by Buran. Now, the progress capsules, which we still have, oh, the insulation received major damage during re-entry, major repair is needed. What did I do? Um, <laughs> don't let operations run out of money, by the way, just a friendly reminder. Don't let planning run out of money either, or else all of a sudden you can't do this. Or this, I suppose, I should be saying. Alright, communications module, PAM, satellite, satellite construction pod.
Let's take Simpson up there and leave him in orbit, and he can do the Bartman in space, dude. Solar flares. Good news is, if I had people up there, they could survive that. The launch pace that I'm keeping up is just kind of nuts here, but it's because you want to equip a station to be crewed. As in occupied by a crew, not as in crude oil, <laughs> crude jokes or whatever. Although that's probably happening up there. I mean, you should look through some of the NASA transcripts from the Apollo missions and, you know, they're talking about their <clears throat> bodily functions. You know, because if it takes three days to get to the moon, three days to get back, you got to talk about something to pass the time. Whoa. Almost a hold free countdown there. And now it's going to throw one at me right at the end. A small liquid hydrogen leak which occurred during the filling of the external tank. But only a small one because go fever. <laughs> it's kind of it, it's kind of interesting the uh, we brought Atlantis in earlier and she had some serious tile damage on the way down. I guess I didn't do as good following the squares as I thought I would. Or maybe it's a completely random event and my following the squares has nothing to do with it and my life has been meaningless. Okay, and that last one was a bit of a stretch, but uh, still I try to play the game as it's intended to be played. Get out there on that pod, Simpson, and eat my shorts. We've got a pretty healthy uh, supply of satellites up here. That's a good thing. Okay, here's what I think I'm going to do. I'm going to put the comms module up here. It's our tree topper. going to I said we're going to grab our radiator module drop it out of the way come on much damage am I getting space debris like laundry and dishes, but in space, it never stops. All right, we've got ourselves a nifty looking little space station here. Nifty bordering on Spiffy. Or is that the other way around? Okay, so we have a place to park the pods. We have a place to park the people. We have a place for the people to shelter from space weather events. And we have satellites. We have a non-stop supply of space debris. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the satellites situated here in the launch area. And then I'm going to boink, <laughs> some cartoon sound effects in there, boink. Then I'm going to, oh, no, didn't mean to do that. Oops. All right. 
Now the irony of it is I am going to take that payload assist module if I can get hold of it and go ahead and attach it to one of those satellites. Boink. Alright, this person in the pod has a place to stay safely. Uh, we're going to send the shuttle home. And from this point on, your shuttle flights can be, you know, they can last like one or two days. They come up, they disgorge their cargo, you send the shuttle back immediately to cut down on operations costs, then you bring out the pod, the EVA pod, from the station, and have whoever is staying on the station take care of moving the cargo around to where it needs to go. Just remember to do it promptly so it doesn't burn up in the atmosphere. Oh, we touched ground before <laughs> before there was runway. It, it worse. It's worse if you actually overshoot the runway and run out of runway. Uh, that'll that'll leave your shuttle in repair for about a month because you've pretty much trashed the landing gear at that point. Only seven days. Okay, I didn't do too badly there. So now we have shuttles on the ground and Simpson in the sky. So we can send them out, launch satellites, send them out to do the space debris stuff, which is what I'm doing now just to kind of pass the time. Whoa, whoa, oh, man, it's like we have litter bugs in space. The number one cause of damage to your pod is space debris. And so, um, kind of take it easy while you've got just one guy up here. That's what I'm doing. If that pod starts getting beaten around, there is no one up there to uh, rescue him. We'll have to reschedule another shuttle launch for a, you know, ASAP and get another pod up there, get another person up there. And let's see, not much damage, so <sighs> let me just do a survey and see how much rubbish we're dealing with. Quite a bit there. And there. And more space debris. Now you do have to contend with space debris once it starts building up right on top of your station. That can interfere with your experiments, I believe, if I remember correctly. Okay, so exit from EVA. Oh, oh, not so fast. back out there, Simpson. You only thought you were done.
Go forth and make some money, my satellite child. So this is this is the point you're really trying to get to, and it's kind of a good space debris. It's kind of a good place to close out hour one of our play along here. Our next launch. Whoa, it's quite a ways off. It's like almost to Christmas, quite a ways off. Next launch will bring up the lab module. Another satellite, and it'll start bringing up things that we will need. <laughs> things to make us go. <laughs> I'm going to start uh, Yeah, see, money's already getting tight here. I'm going to want another crew module, and we're just a little bit short of being able to afford that, unless... Anyway, this isn't too bad. In game time, we are not quite three months into our effort to build the Great American Space Station. Um, that's not too shabby. And we will want to be uh, may rethink the order in which I do this. The next task really is to, uh, you know, as I pointed out, get the lab module up and That way we can start looking at and you know get the research material up. That will still take at least two more flights. So we're at a we're at a good stopping point for doing a, a long play on this game because it is a long play. This is not a game that you are done with in five minutes. Well, I mean, you might decide you're done with it in five minutes if you find it incredibly boring, but. Um, Project Space Station really is a resource management game, more than anything, and in that regard, it's you have to strategize, you have to plan, and then you have to have a backup plan for when things don't go the way you intended, <laughs> which does happen. So we will come back for another hour of this soon. Hope you've enjoyed this first hour. I hope I haven't completely put you to sleep. We'll come back for another hour, and we will actually we'll get the lab module going. We'll get some scientists up there. We'll get some R&D started. And you'll kind of find out how that works. To pause the game, you have to go to the disk manager. Time is frozen by using the disk manager. And I wish I'd known that when I was a much younger man. Of course, uh, actually, <laughs> I did. Well, that's it for the first hour of our play along of Project Space Station. Will the crew survive? Will the shuttles survive? Will any actual research ever actually get done in this joint? Will I get better at flying the bird? I have no idea. Tune in next time, true believers. <laughs>
Don't Give This Tape to Earl, and of course, the daily mini podcast wonder that we call the logbook.com's escape pod, which is sort of this day in history for the geekier side of history. Lots of stuff still going on there, and of course, the massive history timeline that ties it all together and kind of puts the fiction in context with the science. If you like what we're doing and you want to support us, please feel free to visit the logbook.com slash store. Uh, our originals there are always on sale directly from us, ebooks and video bundles, including the aforementioned Phosphor Dot Fossils DVDs, which are now downloadable. And you can also support us directly through patreon.com slash the logbook. And there's lots of exclusive stuff for our patrons as well, including at least one cat video with Maria here. Thanks for tuning in. Say hello to my little friend. <laughs>